start. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, I don't need to introduce uh, Rick Fester. He's is very famous uh, nurse spine surgeon, and uh, he's from Chicago, United States. And he will tell us the complex surgery of the cervical spine uh, history and current state. Uh, we are listening, uh, Dr. Richard Fessler. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon where you are. Uh, this is a lecture that I put together uh, for our residents uh, some time ago. Um, many of us listening today, uh, this will be history. You will, you will have seen these operations and done these operations, uh, and it'll be a, a walk down memory lane for you. Uh, but many, many of you who are listening may not have seen some of the things that I'm going to show you. And what it'll give you, it'll give you an idea of how we developed um, from no instrumentation whatsoever to the current states of our, our instrumentation that we use now. Let me see if I can advance. There we go. And I'm going to get rid of my pictures there. Okay. So these are my disclosures. Um, the ones that are significant are that um, I developed some of the instrumentation that we'll be talking about today. That was many years ago. I no longer get any kind of, uh, of uh, royalties for that, but I did develop some of the instruments we'll talk about. So the question is, what is complex sur cervical surgery? And the surgeries that we'll talk about today come from severe trauma uh, multiple fractures of the cervical spine, congenital malformations, severe infection, osteoporosis, multi-level tumors or intradural tumors, kyphoscoliosis, and OPLL. So here's one unfortunate young man uh, who fell out of a seven-story window and uh, fell on top of a bicycle rack right on his neck. Uh, obviously, this patient was not alive when he came to the emergency room. He has a dislocation of C12 and a dislocation of C7T1. Uh, so he, he was uh, dead on arrival. Um, in order to approach complex surgery, we need to understand the basics. We need to know the anatomy. We need to know normal anatomy so we can recognize variations and alterations. We need to know the specific biomechanical effects in the exact areas of the spine we are dealing with. We need to know the disease process that we're treating, and we need to know what our surgical goals are. And specifically, since much of what we're going to talk about is instrumentation, we need to know what we're going to ask our instrumentation to do, and are we asking more than it can possibly achieve? So, our cervical anatomy that we need to understand. We need to understand our muscular anatomy, uh, the sternocleidomastoid and the omohyoid. We need to understand our, our vascular triangle with the carotid and the jugular and the uh, uh, vagus nerve. We need to know the trachea and, and the cerv anterior cervical. Most, mostly what we fear is injuring the esophagus most of the time. Vertebral artery may come into play sometimes, particularly in anomalous uh, anatomy. If we get a little bit lower down, we need to know where the arch of the aorta is and the, and the brachial uh, vein. Uh, we need to know where the recurrent laryngeal nerve is. I personally always operate from the left side because I know where the recurrent laryngeal nerve is at all times then, uh, whereas on the right side it can be anywhere. And if we're really far down at the thoracic junction, we need to uh, we need to be aware of the thoracic duct on the left side as well. One of the questions regarding trauma, especially when I was in training, was whether you should operate early or whether you should not operate early. And the prevailing feeling at that time was that it was you, sh you should not operate acutely in cervical trauma. Uh, there's increased bleeding and you can, it can lead to uh, worse outcomes. Um, Patients often unstable in the face of, of polytraumas. Uh, so they're probably getting other types of surgery from the general surgery of the trauma team. And the older data demonstrated that it was not a good idea. More recent data, however, suggests that you should operate acutely uh, as, as rapidly as you can. 
First of all, uh, you can get a better neurologic result by decompressing the neural result, the neural structures that way. But if you can get in and decompress and realign and stabilize, then you could prevent all the secondary complications we often see, such as pneumonias, urinary tract infections, bed sores uh, that occur when they are in prolonged bed rest. So current feeling is to operate early and, uh, and to get the patient mobilized. We avoid pulmonary embolus, DVTs, neurogenic bladder, urinary tract infection, decubitus ulcers, ileus, and pneumonia. So the firm indications for early trauma surgery are a progressive neurologic deficit, uh, enlarging hematoma, excessive bleeding, uh, a, the presence of a foreign body, um, or a CSF leak. Relative indications are incomplete neurologic injury, distal or sacral sparing, severe deformity or instability, uh, particularly with ligamentous laxity, uh, significant neural compression, such as from a herniated disc or a retropulse bone fragment, or a patient's inability to tolerate an orthosis. Indications for operating in other conditions, such as infection, failure to respond to antibiotics, instability, neurologic deficit or severe pain, and in tumors, an expanding lesion, neurologic deficit, instability, lack of a diagnosis, patients are not responsive, or the tumor is not responsive to radiation, or the patient is in severe pain. Given those indications, then what are the goals of surgery? Well, the first goal is to decompress neural elements, and that's done by removing fractured retropulse bone. Uh, if there's a CSF leak, to seal the CSF leak somehow to remove any foreign bodies and to de uh, debris devitalized tissue. Next, we want to restore anterior load bearing, and we do that with intervertebral body grafts, either bone or synthetic. We compress across the graft and we, we restore the load bearing uh, continuity of the anterior column. We also then want to restore the posterior tension band. And those are done with a variety of things, spinous process wiring, interspin interspinous plates, uh, sublaminar wiring, or lateral mass plates or screw and rod systems. And then anteriorly, we put in an anterior plate, an anterior band such as a plate to maintain the graft in position, to keep proper spinal alignment, to maximize Wolf's Law and give us the highest probability of getting uh, a fusion. Oh, one way to get a, a cervical injury. Here's another interesting cervical injury, um, something that we obviously would want to use instrumentation for. This uh, gentleman uh, was a person who took care of uh, retired uh, circus animals. Uh, there was a, a farm near uh, University of Florida where I used to teach that took care of retired uh, circus animals. And he was feeding a Bengal tiger one day and the tiger attacked him, uh, grabbed him by the neck and shook him. He obviously was also dead on arrival. Uh, but one thing this teaches you is how a Bengal tiger actually kills its prey. It doesn't lacerate them and it doesn't suffocate them. It fractures their neck. An adult Bengal tiger male can bite with 1,100, that is 1,100 pounds per square inch. So what they do is they, they grab their prey by the neck, uh, bite and twist and dislocate their head, paralyze them, and then take their time at, what, what, at eating them. So uses of instrumentation, what we're gonna do with it, we're gonna reduce the fracture, align the spine, uh, stabilize it, uh, distract the disc spaces and augment fusion. Limitations on instrumentation are imposed by several things. The limitations on what we can do with instrumentation are imposed by the extent and the nature of the pathology, by the variations on normal anatomy, the specific biomechanics of that region, the quality of the bone, the instrumentation that we have available to us, and the experience of the surgeon. And again, it, the question becomes how much you want to accomplish with the instrumentation and not asking too much of it. 
So let's start at the occipital cervical junction. Uh, you'll, you'll note a complete C occipital cervical dislocation here, foramen magnum. The meeting will uh, start. Uh, foramen magnum is up here, by the way. So indications for occipital cervical stabilization, uh, rheumatoid arthritis with cranial settling uh, and status post transoral odontoidectomy, uh, congenital craniovertebral junction abnormalities, correction of a swan neck deformity, uh, status post uh, destabilizing surgery for cranial base tumors, and a traumatic occipital cervical uh, dislocation if the patient is lucky enough to be alive following that. Another way to get a cervical injury. So what are our, op our options for occipital cervical stabilization? You can do a rod and a screw system. Uh, there's a, uh, one addition to that is a bolt that we'll point out. You can use a plate and a screw system, or you can use a rod and a cable system. So the things you want to be careful of is that you position your head in the neutral position or slightly flex because the patient needs to be able to see his feet, particularly if the patient's going downstairs, if they've got an occipital cervical fusion in a bad position, it, it becomes particularly hazardous for them. Um, you want to avoid diving into a large unprotected space between the occiput and C1. You want to avoid the loop of the vertebral artery coming over the top of C1. And you want to pack abundant bone between the occiput and C1 to actually make sure you get a fusion. Uh, you want to plan on translation if you're using a, a rod and a cable system, because the, the, rod, the uh, cables like to slide or the wires like to slide along the rods. Uh, you want to drill carefully to avoid a dural leak. Uh, you, if you're using the sublaminar cables or, or wires, you want to pass it carefully. You typically do a, a bend in the wire about the size of a quarter. Uh, and you want to make sure that you tighten it equally on both sides. When you're passing underneath the lamina or the skull, uh, you want to be hold, hold up on both ends so that the wire or cable cannot get pushed into the spinal canal or the cranium. And you want to ensure that your rod is, has good apposition to the bone. So for example, this is a, a, a system that we would have done years ago. Uh, there's a cable system up here holding it to the skull and then the rod is bent uh, to contour to the neck. Now, this was an interesting patient. Uh, this was a, a young man who had extensive neurofibromatosis. He had tumors on his motor and sensory branch of every single level in his cervical spine. His worst one, as I recall, was at C3, and he was becoming quadriplegic from that. But you can't take all of those tumors because if you take all of the motor roots, you'll be paralyzed. But if, even, if you even leave the motor roots and take all the sensory roots, you'll have an asensate arm and that's a totally useless arm. So we could not take his tumors. We did take the one that was compressing his cord so badly, but then what we did was we removed all of his posterior column. In other words, his spinous process, his lamina, his facets, and we drilled his pedicles all the way down to the vertebral bodies so that he had no posterior lateral elements. We then did an extensive anterior fusion. This is an old Caspar plate with bilateral bicortical purchase of all of his screws. And then since he had nothing in between here to connect to, we merely connected to the skull and then we went well down into his thoracic spine. This was an amazingly aggressive operation, but for him, it turned out to be incredibly successful he eventually went on to become a pharmacist, believe it or not. This was the most reliable stabilization system we had for many years. Uh, it really required intact lamina at some, some place, in this case, down the thoracic spine. Uh, it required an adequate size of a canal so you could pass the wires or the cables. The failure mechanism of this was that the rods would sometimes erode through the cranium and the, the cables that you put in could translate along the rod. So you had to figure out a way to prevent that from happening. Second patient here, cervical stenosis over multiple levels. This was the, uh, the first plates we had available to us. These were called Hague plates. 
And this is uh, with an occipital uh, extension here. Um, and then it was bent down into the cervical spine. The uh, problem with this system was that it was, this was a very thick plate and it was very hard to bend and you couldn't bend it laterally. It, it, it could only bend it in flexion or extension. So it made lining your screws up fairly difficult uh, to achieve. Um, the screws in this, in the occipital, uh, the original occipital extension uh, were only lateral and the bone laterally can sometimes be quite thin. So failure mechanism uh, was to, oh, let's go. Failure mechanism was screw pull out. Here's a, a patient with congenital abnormality of the cervical spine, uh, multi-level clipophile syndrome. All of the posterior elements are spontaneously fused. This is not a fusion. This was a congenital abnormality. And she had this massive, uh, osteophyte here pushing into her spinal cord right at the cranial cervical junction. So that was removed originally transorally. And this is a second generation plate and rod system that we had uh, where the, this was offset. So the screws were offset and we could now put the screws in the midline, which where the bone is much thicker. Failure mechanism on these, however, was still screw pull out. Um, our limitations were imposed by the quality of the bone. Laterally, the bone is thin. In the midline, it's much thicker, but early on, people were afraid of putting screws in the midline uh, because of the sphere sagittal sinus and the potential for a hemorrhage. Um, it's also, that's the most mobile segment of the spine. So it's got a tremendous flexion moment and it puts real stress on, that, on the screw bone interface. So in order to get around, around that, we developed these, these bolts where you would, you would drill a hole in the skull with a slot next to it. You'd put the bolt through the hole and then slide it into the slot and tighten it down. So now you're really kind of clamping onto the uh, skull, which was much more rigid than our screw systems at that time. But then all we did was translate the failure mechanism to screw pull out in the cervical spine rather than screw pull up from the, the cranium. And some of our plates that we developed would fracture because they weren't rigid enough. Ultimately, this is more, cl closer to what we would, we would use now. Uh, we have a cervical rod system with uh, variable angle screw screws. So it's much easier to get our rod in. Our rods are typically 3.5 millimeters in diameter and a little bit easier to bend and our Sir, our occipital plate systems now allow us to put screws out laterally and in the midline, and we can even move this up and down so that we can now get a very rigid uh, stabilization system in the, in the skull that doesn't fail nearly as often as the ones we, we would use years ago. That was a uh, T78 complete fracture dislocation. How about anterior instrumentation? Indications for using anterior instrumentation are cervical trauma, cervical tumor, osteomyelitis, cervical stenosis with myelopathy or OPLL, uh, degenerative disc disease or, or cervical kyphosis. So the options for anterior cervical instrumentation are odontoid screws, cervical plates, and we have a variety of types of them, unrestrained, restrained back out, screw interface, which would allow rotation, screw interface, which allows translation and translation along the axis of the plate itself. We have buttress plates. We have zero profile uh, plates and cages. We have typical cages and then we've got artificial discs. So indications for um, odontoid screws are pretty much the best indication is a traumatic type two odontoid fracture, which is less than six months old. So here's a patient coming in with a, an acute odontoid fracture. Originally, we were putting two screws in. Uh, the first screw would be a lag screw so that we could actually pull the odontoid down onto the body of C2. And then the second screw was additional uh, strength to hold it there. Ultimately, we went to one screw. Failure mechanism of these screws is getting the wrong angle 
and missing the dens. So here's the dens, and the screw is actually behind it in the spinal canal. And sometimes the screws would actually work, they would translate and keep going in uh, too far. Uh, ultimately, we went to using a single screw. Uh, anatomic limitations are patients who are very barrel chested, uh, women who have very large breasts. And if it's an oblique fracture through the dens, uh, the odontoid screw doesn't work very well. Uh, who could identify the, uh, the pathology in this patient? Uh, to come right to the point, there are actually nine cervical vertebrae here. This is two x-rays overlying each other. Uh, looking in this patient, this patient has a complete block here at C3-4 with severe stenosis. In him, we did a three-level corpectomy and an early Caspar plate. This was second generation Caspar plate. Uh, it has a slot on one side and, and just holes on the other side. Uh, the, the generation one had slots on both sides and the screws would slide along the plate and then they would impinge upon the adjacent level, cause degeneration and usually that level would then fuse. So this was the first attempt to prevent translation. But the, what that also did was it, would, it didn't prevent translation. The screws would just break. So the failure mechanisms on, on this plate, the Caspar plates, was fractures of the screw or screws backing out. Particularly if you did not go bicortical, these would back out. Another patient with a degenerative disc disease, uh, significant uh, stenosis at two levels. In this case, uh, we did a two-level discectomy with fibular allograft. This was uh, the uh, synthes plate. I think it was called CSLP. And these screws now would lock into the head, the plate uh, to prevent backout. So with backout being one of our concerns of failure mechanisms, our next step was to figure out ways to prevent backout. Uh, that was one of them. This is the Orion plate, and there was a little screw, an overscrew here that locked the screw heads in. You can see it clearly there and prevent them from backing out. So the failure mechanisms of the CSLP plate was that the screws would fracture or the plate would fracture. Same thing for the Orion, the screws would fracture, um, and the, the little cap there that you put on would, would occasionally come uh, come loose. The, the major problem with both of these plates was that they were so rigid that we actually increased our pseudoarthrosis rate compared to, for example, the Caspar plate that we had been using. So these, plate, these plates turned out to be too rigid. The other thing was that in the CSLP, the screws were so large that if it failed, you couldn't, you couldn't recover that level. There was, no, there was no bone left. So you had to actually go to, you had to fuse the adjacent level in order to recover that failure. And with the, with the Orion, the screws were at a dedicated 15 degree angles. So uh, you had to be very careful on where you put the edge of your plate so that you did not uh, go into the adjacent level disc. Another patient uh, with uh, stenosis and osteophytes going out into the foramen. Uh, this was another plate. Uh, this was a uh, another Medtronic plate. And in this one, um, the uh, bottom was dedicated, the top was variable angle. And this, so variable angle here would allow this to rotate uh, within, on the plate, but within the body. And the, so the failure mechanism there was that the rotation would cut through the cancellous bone and loosen the plate. Uh, there was a cam locking mechanism on this, which occasionally would not uh, engage the head of the screw, so you had difficulty locking the screw head to the plate itself. Another patient with severe stenosis. And this was a translatable plate. This was a plate called ABC plate uh, developed by Ron Apfelbaum. And what you would, uh, and it would allow uh, the screw head to translate within uh, the, the plates here so that uh, the, the first 
The first phase of a fusion is, is osteoclasis, not osteoblastus. So uh, as you get osteoclasis, you develop a little gap between your allograft and your, autog and your uh, host bone. If you, if you have a very rigid plate, that can give you a pseudoarthrosis. This allowed the, the bone to collapse onto the allograft and give you a higher, higher fusion rate. So for example, here you can see immediately post-op where the location of the screw head is. And now you can see that it's actually translated quite a bit. Again, here's the, here's the screw head here, and you can see how much it's translated over here. So there are multiple systems that allowed translation like that. This was the Medtronic answer to that. Um, again, th it allows translation here. Here and here are locked in. These are dedicated angles. These are variable angle. And this plate here slides up and down. And when you slide it up, it locks the screws in place and they can't back out. Um, there was a system called the dock system I'll show you in a minute. I, we just talked about the ABC. This was Premier. Uh, and then there was Swift. So this is the dock system uh, developed by Ed Benzel. Um, and Ed Benzel, of course, is the Premier uh, uh, biomechanics uh, guru. Uh, and so he developed a plate that would allow variable angle of the screws. It would allow this to translate along these rods. Um, so the problem with this system though, was that all of these pieces are independent. So if you think about it, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces uh, that you have to work with uh, in order to, to assemble this plate. And you, you, had, you had this whole handful of stuff and it was just, it was just too fiddly, too many pieces. This was the ABC plate we were talking about. The way this plate failed was twofold. Uh, number one, you had to engage this little screw here in order to expand this screw head and lock it in place. You can see that there are grooves in here. So the screw would, would be seated down into, that, into the groove and then you would lock this in place to expand it and lock it in place. Um, occasionally this was hard to engage and the screw head uh, to actually engage that was so small that sometimes it would fracture. So that was the failure mechanism of this. The other thing this allowed it to do was when it went back to the old Caspar plate uh, where it allowed the, um, the, the screws to translate along the plate and impinge upon the adjacent level. So this was Premier. You can see how this comes up and he locks the screws into place. One of the, there are a couple of failure mechanisms for this one. This is a dedicated screw angle. This is variable angle. So again, this allowed it to rotate within the vertebral body and loosen that way. And if this was at too much of an angle, then this plate did not lock it in place and the screws could come out. This is the Swift plate. It's another uh, plate that allows translation, but this one allows translation only along the plate itself, not along the vertebral body. So as this translates, this collapses down, the relationship of the end to the vertebral body does not change. Also, the locking mechanism here was this, this, this def deformable uh, sleeve. So the screw would go down into it. The screw head was a little bit bigger than the sleeve. So as you tightened it down, this would wedge lock the, the, the uh, screw head so that it could not come out. So for example, here you can see this in place and you can see the gap here. And then over time, that would collapse as the fusion occurred but you can see that the relationship of this to the end plate does not change. Another patient with severe myelopathy, very tight canal, and using this plate, multi-level uh, vertebrectomy, bicortical purchase in this case, and the plate now can translate along itself rather than along the vertebral bodies. How about cages? Well, we have, we have many, many different kinds of cages now, uh, some of which uh, just screw in and have no locking mechanism. Some of them actually lock into the plate itself, into the vertebral body itself. The limitations are these. You know, our cervical results with allograft are so good, it's hard to beat that. 
and the failure mechanisms are pseudoarthrosis and extrusion of the cage. The long-term results uh, generally show good results despite um, whatever cage we use. I just recently looked at my data comparing my allograft data to my uh, peak data. And it was very interesting that my allograft fusion rate was in the range of 90%. My, L, my peak fusion rate was in the range of 60%. So the fusion rate, was, well, we were using a very stringent criteria for fusion, but my fusion rate using peak was much less than my fusion rate using uh, allograft, but the clinical results were just as good. Uh, the patients were not coming back and requiring more surgery, even though they weren't fused, uh, the, and they were clinically doing great. How about artificial discs? Uh, the artificial discs are being used almost everywhere in the world now. Uh, my results are uh, at least uh, 12 years out now. Um, one possible mechanism that's always discussed is, is uh, fusion over the, uh, pseudo, over the artificial disc level. Um, and, but at, at, that occurs about 7% of the time. It's not, it doesn't really occur very, very much. Um, how about posterior instrumentation now? Indications for posterior instrumentation are cervical trauma, cervical tumor, osteomyelitis, uh, <clears throat> cervical stenosis with myelopathy or OPLL, uh, degenerative disc disease or cervical kyphosis, but in that case, <clears throat> combining it with anterior fixation as well. So what are our options for posterior instrumentation? Uh, C12 uh, interfacet screws, uh, C1 lateral masses, and combined with C2 pedicle screws, uh, plates and screw systems, rods as uh, screws or hooks, rectangles with cables or wires, or just doing cable and wiring. Uh, in, for C12 interfacet screws, uh, you wanna make sure you've got adequate pre-op studies to know exactly where your vertebral artery is You've got to know your anatomy if you're going to do this procedure. Uh, you use a trajectory toward the anterior arch of C1. And if you hit one vertebral artery, stop. Do not do the other side. I, I do know of one case where a visiting professor was years ago teaching how to do this technique. And he hit the vertebral artery on one side. Uh, and he went and did the other side and hit the vertebral artery on that side and the patient died. Uh, you want to angle approximately five degrees medially. And uh, when you're doing this, it's a good idea to put an instrument on the medial wall of the pedicle uh, so that you know uh, where you are in relation to the spinal canal. And if the patient has a large thoracic hump, such as in diabetes, it can prevent you from using this particular technique. So here is a patient with an unstable uh, fracture of, of the dens. Uh, you can see uh, a wide gap here uh, on a flexion and reducing on extension. This patient had C12 facet screws bilaterally with, with a nice alignment of the spine, good procedure. Uh, this was a patient who uh, was in a car accident and cervical x-rays were done and they found that he had azodontoidium. Uh, he was asymptomatic from it, but they did a, a posterior C12 fusion uh, which did not take. And of course, he fractured those wires. Uh, so they took him back to surgery. And again, you can see now he's a little bit, he moves a little bit on flexion extension. Took him back to surgery and did C12 inner facet screws. This is a big husky guy with a real strong neck. And he fractured both of his screws very quickly. Uh, ultimately, he, he ended up getting a multi-level occipital cervical stabilization uh, using a, a re bent rectangle and multiple level cables. So in my opinion, this is a patient who just should not have had any surgery in the first place. And a, a young man that ultimately ended up with complete uh, loss of motion of, of his cervical spine. Limitations of these systems of C12 facet screws, uh, depending upon the vertebral artery, you may or may not be able to do it. Um, it may not be strong enough without posterior supplementation. 
Uh, it's technically demanding procedure and it's a little bit risky because of the vertebral artery. And it also depends upon the thoracic anatomy, whether you can do it or not. Uh, how about C1 lateral mass screws combined with pedicle screws? In this procedure, you've got to protect the vertebral artery. Uh, it's a good idea to mark the medial wall of the pedicle so you know where you are in relation to the canal. You angle five degrees medially in C2, and you judge your trajectory with lateral fluoroscopy or image guidance. So here's another patient with uh, unstable C12 between flexion and extension. And this patient got uh, C1 lateral mass, C2 pedicle screws, that you can see here with a good, nice stabilization. What you've got to be careful of is vertebral artery, which is going to be right here, and the C2 nerve. Now, one of the techniques utilized is to come down and take C2 nerve and just go into the vertebral body right here. I don't like that technique personally because you, I don't like taking C2 and giving them a numb scalp. And the epidural venous plexus down here is so thick, you get quite a lot of bleeding. So I prefer to go right down the pedicle um, of C1. And I, I, I take a Penfield 1 and protect the vertebral artery while I'm doing that. So that avoids taking C2. It avoids all of the bleeding down here. And it gives you a much longer fixation uh, for that uh, C1 stabilization. OK, how about plates and screw systems? This was our original plates, and the first plate system that came out was the Habe plates. Um, they were very thick, relatively hard to bend, but it was our first lateral mass fixation system. Our failures of this system was that the screws would pull out or the screws would, bre would break. Uh, the lateral masses are often soft, which would allow them to pull out. You have a significant flexion force there. If you're already kyphotic, you can't fix kyphosis just posteriorly. Um, it could, this is a system, it was difficult to line the screws up. And the failure mechanism was fracture the screw or, or screw pull out. This was the next generation that came along. Now we went to rods and then we had little offsets, which would allow the screw to go into lateral masses and allowed you a little bit of lateral medial freedom uh, to be able to put those in. Failure mechanism again was screw pull out. Uh, and then this was the latest generations that we use with uh, universal heads that will go lateral uh, cephalad caudal. So it makes lining up your screws a little bit easier. 3.5 millimeter rods with set screws on top. And this is typically what we do now. Uh, failure mechanisms of these are, are still screw pull out. It's easier to line up our screw heads and our rods. So it's easier to get the rods seated. And uh, we discussed uh, rectangle and, and cable systems earlier. So we don't have to repeat that. Again, one of the ways, one of the things we had to worry about was translation. And one of the ways we solved that was to make sure we had wires on the bottom down here that would not slide around to prevent translation. So how about complex uh, craniovertebral reconstruction? This was a gentleman who was driving drunk and uh, lost control of his car and unfortunately killed two children. Uh, they happened to be the children of a, uh, of a lawyer, so he got sentenced to life in prison. Uh, while in prison, he was beat up by some of the other inmates and taken to uh, a hospital where they found uh, that craniovertebral, let me see if I can go back, that craniovertebral or cervical uh, dislocation. Um, and what they, I, I don't know if they were thinking, but what they did was a laminectomy. Uh, and he got worse, so they brought him back and uh, did further laminectomy. He got worse again and developed that swan neck deformity. And when I finally, uh, when he finally came to me, we did this anterior and posterior 360 degree uh, reconstruction, got him pretty well lined up. Uh, for multi-level disease, here's a four-level vertebrectomy. We rarely do these anymore. We mostly do multi-level discectomies now. But in the, in the, uh, at this time, we, we did a multi-level uh, vertebrectomy for multi-level uh, uh, compression of his spinal cord with an anterior and a posterior reconstruction. Uh, this patient is a 67-year-old male. He's got neck pain and left arm pain uh, following a compression injury to his neck. 
Uh, he's got four over five strength in his right deltoid and bicep and diffusely absent reflexes. Again, he's got this huge step off here on C3-4 with significant compression of his spinal cord at that level. He underwent a multi-level decompression with posterior stabilization in, in his lateral masses. But he was pulling out ventrally uh, because of his kyphotic deformity. And then we, went, we redid him posteriorly and then did him anteriorly as well, giving him pretty good uh, cervical uh, lordosis. Another case, uh, this was a 44-year-old male, uh, status post a motor vehicle accident and multiple cervical surgeries. Uh, he had uh, complicated with a cervical infection. Uh, all of his anterior instrumentation was removed. Uh, he had eight over 10 constant neck pain uh, and he was addicted to narcotics uh, at the time we saw him. So he had actually solidly fused all the way across the front, uh, which is why they were able to take all his instrumentation out but he had uh, severe kyphotic deformity here and uh, severe neck pain. And again, in his case, we did a three uh, level vertebrectomy, uh, allograft reconstruction in front, bicortical uh, purchase on his plates and posterior uh, instrumentation from C2 down to C7 with a really, really good lordotic uh, reconstruction. Another patient uh, with severe rheumatoid arthritis Kyphotic deformity here at uh, five six, with significant compression of her spinal cord, white matter changes uh, in the cord itself. We did a two level vertebrectomy on her. I used the ABC translatable plate, which looked pretty good at first, but then over time she started falling off. And now here you can see um, how, as the plate translated, it actually went up into the disc space of the adjacent level up here. So we had to uh, redo her and we took her and redid the front, uh, redid it posteriorly uh, with a relatively good uh, stabilization of this rheumatoid patient. So in summary, uh, instrumentation uh, has improved our ability to care for simple and complex spine problems. Uh, you can see how limited we were uh, when we started, what we had to, what we had to work with and uh, how we had to be relatively creative in order to get that to work. Um, but over time, we developed better instrumentation systems that allow us a great deal of versatility. And uh, we can now do uh, much more with our instrumentation that we were able to do uh, years ago. Still, our success depends upon our understanding of the problem, our skill level, and understanding what the limitations are that are imposed both by the anatomy and by the instrumentation. So thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, th thank you, Rick. Um, very, uh, really very complex cases you have shown us. Um, there are, yes, some questions uh, from the participants. I can start asking them. Uh, One of them is, uh, what, uh, what is your preference, uh, ACDF or uh, cervical arthroplasty for single level disc disease? It depends upon the patient. Uh, in a young patient or even in an, an elderly patient who has good discs um, and not a lot of uh, osteophyte formation, um, I prefer to use um, arthroplasty. Um, but if the patient is coming in and, and it, you know, you, they've already got large osteophytes and you can tell they're gonna fuse no matter what you do, in that patient, I will do a fusion. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen it, that you use cervical pedicle screws in the subaxial spine. Do you ever use them? I don't use pedicle, pedicle screws, except for C2. Um, no, well, I guess in C1 too, I, I actually go right down the pedicle. I just, I prefer uh, the, just a facet screw. Um, I don't have, uh, I have almost no failure rate with them. Um, and it's a much safer procedure to do. So I don't do pedicle screws. I will at C7 okay. occasionally. Well, what's your uh, 
uh, preference uh, for an osteotomy in cervical deformity, do you try to make it from ventral or dorsal? Uh, typically, we'll go dorsal, and I'll try and do it uh, at C7, T1, uh, if I, and, and correct the uh, kyphosis at that level. And then I'll do anterior and posterior instrumentation. OK. Uh, one participant is asking, why does barrel chest or females with big breasts make it hard for an odontoid screw implantation? Uh, the, all of the systems with the odontoid screw um, have relatively long screwdrivers and drills. And if you've got a barrel chest, um, you can't get the appropriate angle to get into the dens. It, it puts you at too steep of an angle and you end up skiving behind the dens, uh, the tip of the dens. So um, if, if it's borderline, you can push down on the chest and try and get the right angle. Um, but the, a person with a barrel chest makes getting the angle in order to get, in order to capture the tip of the dens very difficult. Exactly. Um, what do you think about anterior lateral partial corpectomy without any fixation materials for degenerative spine? Yeah, you know, that takes us back to the I days. I think he means oblique corpectomy. So I guess. So taking, for example, does he mean taking half of the vertebral body and then having the other half still there? Yes. Um, I personally don't don't do that technique. I think you know it's gonna. I think it's gonna have a high failure rate. Okay. Um, in multiple cervical disc with OPLL, do laminectomies do uh, making a laminectomy only will be sufficient? Um, laminectomy without instrumentation. Uh, OPLL continues to progress. Um, so in, the, in that case, I will, if they have OPLL, I will always supplement it with instrumentation okay. for two reasons. One, one is to stop the progression and the other is um, to put them in enough lordosis so that the spinal cord falls away from the OPLL. Okay. Uh, I think Mauricio wants to ask a question. Yes. Hi, Mauricio. Hi. Uh, Professor Fessler, you never talked about using computer-assisted or CT-assisted surgery, mostly for C1, C2 surgery. Are you using that, it? That's correct. I do not use it. But uh, you know you have unbelievable advantages using it. it uh, well, I have, I have a couple of reasons I don't use it. Uh, one is because I'm an old guy. You know? <laughs> But, <laughs> but the, one of the reasons I don't use it is because all of my younger partners use it. So our residents are using it a lot, but nobody teaches them how to do it without image guidance. And eventually your image guidance machine is gonna be broken and you're gonna to have to do an operation without it. So I, I teach them how to do these operations without image guidance, just using fluoroscopy and knowledge of anatomy so that they know what they're doing and they can do it with guidance or without guidance. I think it's important that they learn how to do it without guidance. You know, the same is true in cranial. I'm not sure our residents know how to localize a tumor without image guidance anymore. Okay. What do you do if the heart wave fails more than once? <laughs> Well, a couple of those cases I showed you, we had that. Um, you know, you you end up um, you end up doing uh, belt belt and straps. You know, you you uh, probably have to go multiple further levels. Um, you have to uh, try and, uh, for example, use BMP to try and make sure you get a fusion. Uh, maybe use bone rather than than peak or or, or titanium cages. Um, and if you have to, uh, for cervical spine, supplement it with a halo uh, for, for immobilization. Um, so you end up doing big operations front and back at multiple, multiple levels. Sometimes you have to include the skull. Yeah, for instance, the, 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 those 
broken screws in the C1, C2 uh, trans article fixation, you cannot remove them. And then you must choose another option. Am yeah. I right? Absolutely, yep. yeah. yeah. Um, what is your preference in cases with OPLL, making a surgery from anterior or posterior? When I started my career, I, 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 I always did them anterior. Um, but, you know, in watching the Japanese literature in particular, they were getting such good results posteriorly that probably for the last 15 years, I do all, almost all my OPLL posteriorly now uh, with either with laminectomy or laminoplasty and posterior instrumentation, putting them into a good lordosis. And my results um, are equally good as when I did it anterior and my complications are much lower. A very basic question. What is the length and diameter of screws, uh, especially in C1, C2 lateral mass screw fixation? Uh, for C1, um, I will typically use uh, about an 18 millimeter screw and uh, 3.5 in diameter. And in, in C2, um, I will often go up to even uh, 22 millimeters. And I will try and make that a four millimeter diameter screw. Uh, I think this question is not a good one, but I, I will ask you how much level laminectomies can be done without instrumentation? Depends upon the anatomy. Uh, depends upon the anatomy. If the patient has good lordosis, um, you don't you don't have to do instrumentation. Um, but if they're if they're straight or if they're kyphotic, then you have to use instrumentation. And the number of levels really doesn't matter. It's really the pre-op anatomy. Uh, okay. There is a question to Salman. Is there a link for the so uh, for the um, uh, this meeting and certificate? Yeah, I think uh, Imad has already answered that. I, I just wanted to uh, congratulate Rick. Thank you for uh, giving such a wonderful talk, just like uh, you always do. I think uh, the, what you have done is taken the residents through basic and taking them all the way forward was amazing. And thank you for sharing uh, all that knowledge with us. Oh, thanks, Salma. What is your opini opinion on fixation for Chiari type one? Um, I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Uh, how can we get training for C1, C2 screwing? Uh, but I think uh, you need to make a cadaver workshop or hands-on courses. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you think about hybrid instrumentation, fusion and uh, arthroplasty together? Um, I will occasionally do that. Say if a patient comes in and they've been fused um, at say C6-7 and they have an acute herniated disc at 5-6, um, I will do that with an arthroplasty. Um, and the other way around, if they've got an arthroplasty, um, but um, you know they, they're coming in and they've already got a very degenerated level um, that I think is gonna fuse even if I, no matter what I do, I'll fuse that level. So the combination, I think, is works fine. Kindly explain the vertebral artery protecting technique in C1 screwing. So I will take um, a Penfield 1, the flat part of a Penfield 1 retractor, and I will slide it between the vertebral artery and the arch of C1 so that it's completely protected. And then when I drill right alongside that into the pedicle of C1, I don't have to worry about the vertebral artery. I've got it. I've got it completely protected. Okay. I think <coughs> we can uh, finish the questions here. It was really a very nice uh, presentation and very complex cases you have shown us. Thank you again. Uh,